and professors here at OSU and people from uh, actually across the globe. We're having people from Australia um, and the rest of the United States. So um, it's nice to see the, the level of interest that we have here. I also want to to start off with some thank yous. Uh, Dr. Chad Higgins here has taken the lead for the invitations and uh, and, and organization of this seminar series. And Allison Marshall, where are you, Allison? Has been just a, a stalwart TA this term, this term and the previous two terms, helping to make brand with the speakers and get things set up. She, if you are registered for this as a course for credit, she is the keeper of the attendance sheet and that will be circulating. So if you're registered for credit, make sure that you sign in on the attendance sheet and that that sheet gets back to Allison at the end of the period. Um, but I do want to say thank you, Chad and Allison. There are also thanks to, because we have a, a lovely reception following the each of these seminars downstairs in room 3009, I believe it is, just follow the, follow the crowd. And that is uh, because Dr. John Selker and a number of other community members pitched in to fund refreshments and uh, provide the opportunity for us to, to meet and chat and have some, some good food. And I want to thank the hydrophiles and in particular Noah Brewis for making that happen as well. So. A uh, quick note, also we have upcoming Water Resources Research Symposium, if that is hosted by the Hydrophiles. And if you're in the Water Resources Graduate Program, you are required to, to uh, present at least one time in your career here at OSU. And it's, it's actually great fun and we shouldn't be having to require people because it's a great experience. So Allison Marshall, again, is uh, uh, somebody that you could talk to about turning in your abstract for your talk. And uh, it's a great place to receive feedback if you're just proposing the work that you're going to do. It's a great place to receive feedback if you are uh, have finished your work and are, are starting to write it up for your final defense. So uh, wherever you're at in the program, you should be you should be giving a presentation or a poster at the Water Resources Research Symposium. Those abstracts are due April 7th, and. Um, then finally, I will turn this over to Richard Planka, who has something to say too. But I want you to know that uh, with the seminar speakers who are coming from out of town, if you would like to arrange time to meet with them, you can con contact either Allison or Chad, because they're helping to set up the speaker schedules for meeting with students and the faculty as well. So you know, we are we're spending a lot of money to bring these people in. We'd like them to have people to talk to while they're here. So make sure you, you know, go go down that list and find the people that you are most interested in, in uh, meeting with and make sure you get on our schedules. Okay? How many days are they coming? Uh, most are coming for about a day and a half. So they will be here almost all day Wednesday and often part of the day on Tuesday, but late afternoon. But Wednesday is usually the best day to get on their schedule. All right, I'm going to turn it over. Uh, Dr. Planta has... Okay, thanks very much. Um, from time to time, we take the opportunity to dedicate seminar series to someone who's had the impact in uh, hydrology and hydrology program at Oregon State University. And I know uh, Julie Jones has, uh, also has someone that uh, she will ask us to remember. But uh, we're uh, dedicating the seminar series to Dr. Philippe Bourbet this year. Philippe was an annual visitor to the department in the 1980s and was instrumental in establishing the uh, valve transpiration investigation plot, the ETIP plot that some of you have worked up endless columns of data off of, and um, and uh, was uh, uh, he spent his career as a researcher with the Institut National de Recherche Agronomique in France, and specifically with the precise wing lysimeter site in Versailles. Uh, the final design on this site, uh, Philippe had the reputation of probably installing more precise wing lysimeters than anyone else, but he, uh, the final design had a lysimeter that had the least disturbance of the soil profile and an accuracy, or I should say a precision, of equivalent and about transpiration measurements of 0.1 millimeters of water. And so with this kind of precision, we can make very fine uh, scale in terms of time measurements of about transpiration. Uh, Philippe was generous with his uh, knowledge and experience and his data. 
And in fact, one of the uh, later speakers in the seminar series, uh, Dr. Gabriel Catul, his first publication was co-authored with Philippe because he used a number of years of similar data from the Versailles installation in that publication. Uh, Philippe uh, passed away a week before uh, Christmas, and we will uh, be sending a letter to his family uh, indicating the dedication of the seminar series to him. Thank you. Gail started out in an adversarial 
position as a lawyer arguing these cases. Then she came back to Oregon, worked with Governor Neil Goldschmidt, and later with Kitzhaber. But then she, she underwent a transition because she became more interested in science, and she also became much more interested in cooperative rather than adversarial activities. And so when she came to the Institute for Natural Resources at OSU, it was because she had already become interested in ecosystem services and trying to get communities and people to work together to understand the value of their resources and manage them cooperatively. And interestingly, that trend very much has influenced the science that you're doing, so that we now have major endeavors like John Wolfe's Envision program, for example, which sort of captures this notion <clears throat> that the people who need to be reached are the stakeholders and the individual decision makers. And so it's a different kind of climate for science that is, in some ways, encapsulated by the transitions that Gail in her lifetime. I met her as part of an NRC National Research Council um, panel <clears throat> where the NRC pulls together experts from around the country to write a report about a particular uh, issue. This one was forest hydrology in the light of climate change. And at the first meeting, we went to Las Vegas, and Gordon and I walked down the strip and looked at the fountains at the Bellagio. And I was there on Sunday, but the, we went to look for the fountains, but they don't have a fountain anymore. The Bellagio Casino just has a huge lake. So what could be a, more of an expression of profligacy to have a huge, deep, open lake evaporating? in the middle of Las Vegas. <clears throat> anyway, we went to various places around the country for these different meetings, and I got, I got to travel with Gail and talk with her a lot about the relationship between law and science and our hydrologic science. And a concept that she got me to thinking about is the way in which water is sort of universally distributed physically and biologically but socially, it's managed by all these disparate entities. You know, here it is flowing through this landscape from, you know, in our Western uh, ecosystems, flowing through snow-covered or mountain forested mountain headwaters, through dams, you know, through wetlands, through agricultural fields, through suburban and urban areas. And so, what what this tells us is that. We need to think about the geography of the jurisdiction of water, and particularly, we need to think about that when we consider contemporary issues in water resources, resources such as climate change. And in particular, you know, there is this question of how climate change may produce effects on water, and whether or how they may propagate down through the watershed to influence the places where stakeholders, people who may perceive change and then act on it, may sense the changes being wrought by climate change on their water resources. So this raises a question. There's seats down here, Desiree. Um, so this raises questions about how, how, how do you go about it? asking these questions. Well, well, one way to think about this is that where there are places where there are long-term studies in headwater ecosystems, you may think of the headwater ecosystem as a sort of a reference system and consider its behavior over time by comparison to successive points down the watershed to the mouth of a river basin. And so we can think of that in terms of the, the records we have of stream flow, the spatial records we have of land use change, the records we have of climate change at these different places. And we can also think of this in terms of the way in which control over and management of that water changes as you move. Just look at the top of this slide. You know, from the headwaters on the left-hand side down to the mouth of a sort of a cartoon of a western large basin where we may have federal wilderness land, no intervention, let burn, 
um, federal forest land, maybe some logging, flood control reservoirs at the edge of the national forest land. The, the reservoirs may be managed primarily for flood control, but perhaps also for other uses. Then the river flows through private industrial forest land or small private forest landowners, more dams, more hydro, other uses, flows into agricultural land. Now here, the management of the water may depend on the prior appropriation water rights and water withdrawals by agricultural land users, and then the water flows into suburban or urban areas where prior appropriation may apply for municipal water rights. So <clears throat> here we have the spectrum. The people <clears throat> often, in the cases of the in the case of the Columbia River, may be mostly living down in the right-hand corner of this diagram. But we're interested in whether they can perceive the changes that are being perpetrated on the system in the upper left-hand corner based on whether those changes actually flow down to them in a place where they could perceive them. So that's the way we're thinking about the Columbia River Basin. And, and in so doing, we end up sort of tripping over or coming across many of the major themes that have governed water resources over the decades, and now I'm old enough to have actually participated in quite a few of these. You know, when dams and water resource management structures were being constructed, the emphasis was on a sort of a command and control philosophy. There must be an optimal way to design a system of dams and, you know, um, channels to try to convey water for the benefit of human use. But then people started to think about the ecosystem and how that influenced, how those structures influence various aspects of the flow. And then this got enshrined in Leroy Pop's natural flow regime so that then people started to think about, well, what are the effects of river regulation as well as other things that people are doing to the landscape, land use, and forestry, and now, in the last couple decades, climate change, what are those things doing to flows? And then you bring in this idea of multiple jurisdictions in a large river basin. So the question that I wanted to answer in the study that I'm going to talk about today is, what are the relative magnitudes and locations of these various processes? And I'm really thinking about climate change, river regulation, and a little bit of land use forestry <coughs> on the Columbia River Basin. <coughs> and what, do, what questions does it raise about how we might, how we might operate as scientists well, in the effort to try to help our society do something, what, mitigate climate change? You know, we'll see. So, to, to help us in this, at least I hope it will help. Um, so, we, we're focusing on climate change effects on stream flow and water supply, incorporating a little bit of land use and certainly the regulatory effects as represented by the presence of dams along the flow path. And we're invoking these two ideas, ecological resilience and engineering resilience. And these were um, <clears throat> defined um, by C.S. Holling and Carl Folk 10, 15 more years ago. And in this talk, I, I think of ecological resilience as the capacity of headwater ecosystems to sustain stream flow under climate change. So there's some kind of pattern of stream flow, an annual hydrograph, an interannual hydrograph that is produced from headwater ecosystems. And we'll call them ecologically resilient if they can undergo climate change but sustain that pattern of stream flow. On the other hand, there is this concept of engineering resilience, which is that, as interpreted here, I'm interested in the capacity of a system of dams and reservoirs to kind of buffer, mitigate, or overprint the signal of climate change that might, might hypothetically be coming in 
tips of the drainage net. So let's I'll be a little better about defining these terms and attributing them to their uh, originators. You know, C.S. Holling talked about ecological resilience. It's a property of ecosystems as we understand them, which is that they they are persistent, but they change. And they surprise us. And in 60 years of stream flow records from the H.J. Andrews Forest, we see that. You know, they, they are persistent. But the systems are changing. Even those 500-year-old forests are changing. And they're surprising us in how they're changing. And the other component for water resources about ecosystem or ecological resilience is that a, an ecologically resilient system can be thought of as one in which all of the components of the hydrologic cycle are present or functioning in the headwaters. So this gets back to my notion that if you have long-term records at reference locations in headwater ecosystems, they may be used as references to examine whether or how ecological resilience might be present. And then it, the engineering resilience is a different concept. Here it's, you know, a focus on efficiency, constancy, and predictability. And in the case of water resources or a system of dams and reservoirs, clearly that's the idea. You want a predictable supply of water for users. You want the water to be convey, conveyed efficiently and constantly. You want to assure water supply at the time when it's needed. So the diagram up here is sort of the way I was thinking about the, the design of the research more abstractly. So we have water flowing from left to right, from headwaters to downstream. And the, the triangles are dams, you know. And, and so we have records at each place where the box says stream flow. So we have a long-term record of stream flow in the headwaters which we think of as our reference site. And hopefully, we find a climate record nearby so we can answer, we can look at how closely the uh, stream flow record is related to the climate record there to gain an understanding of ecological resilience in the headwaters. And then we can look at long-term stream flow records that successively moving downstream and compare the patterns of those stream flow changes to the ones upstream and ask if they're doing the same thing. They ought to do the same thing, right? In an unmodified uh, system, the, the properties would be governed by the flow route characteristics of an unmodified river basin. So we ask these questions, how has climate changed in headwaters? How has stream flow changed over time or responded to the climate change? above dams, and how is it responded downstream of dams, and what does this tell us about ecological and engineering resilience? We found seven sub-basins in the Columbia River where we could find long-term stream flow records above dams, where there were matching records at a succession of ages moving downstream. Many, most of the records are 60-year records, so it's a combination of records from the U.S. Forest Service, which typically is the source of works on gauging the headwater ecosystems, and USGS records, which are further downstream. We found a climate record near the headwater gauge record. And then we worked on fitting trends to every day of the water year. So here's the water year, you know, you're looking at it this way. And then here's 60 years of it coming toward me, right? And so here's October 15th during the water year, and we're interested in what has been the trend on October 15th of every year of that 60-year period. Has the flow gone up or gone down? Has temperature gone up or gone down? And by how much? And the reason for looking at every day of the water year is because many of the concerns about climate change impacts on water resources have to do with the changes in the timing of water delivery during the year, right? Earlier snowpack, diminished late summer low flows. So that's what, what we want to know. We only found seven places in the Columbia River Basin, as indicated by the seven red dots, where there was a long-term record 
of stream flow at a location above dams. Which is interesting because, of course, USGS does have a set of gauges, gauge records, which are supposed to be in unregulated basins, but in many cases those records, and even some of these, are influenced by various forms of water regulation, including direct and indirect effects. And then at each of those places, we, we collected the matching records following just going downstream from each of those sites, in the Willamette Basin, and then the Entiat, which is in Washington, and Priest River in Washington, and the Bruno Basin down here, which is a tributary of the Snake, the Pond Array, the Salmon, and the Snake River Basin. And these sub-basin diagrams are just a sort of a Rorschach ink blot thing to give you an idea of the density of dams as indicated by the triangles in each of those sub-basins. Lots of dams in the Willamette and the Snake and the Pond Array, but some in these other basins also. You know, in the Pacific Northwest, one of the reasons water scarcity uh, is, is an issue is because the fact that we have orographic rainfall means that we end up with more water, more rainfall, more snow, and more precipitation in the higher elevation portions of our landscape, but our rivers flow downstream into increasingly drier areas. And so we see that if we plot drainage area versus the mean annual runoff for these seven study basins, once the basins get above 100 square kilometers or so, the mean annual discharge starts to, to decline. And this is partly a is certainly a natural thing. It would happen even in the absence of land use, but it may be exacerbated possibly by the way the water is being used and how it's influencing evaporation. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a taste of some of the characteristics of two of the sub-basins in the Columbia. The Willamette River, which is shown by the red X's, and the Snake, which is shown by the blue. And so I'm going to do a little sort of close-up story, an east side story and a west side story, with apologies to Leonard Winston. Um, so here's the Snake River Basin. Land cover, you know, you, the land cover is dominated by shrub or scrub vegetation, evergreen forest, grasslands, and a little bit of area of cultivated crops, not much. And the hydrograph and the hydrograph, the hydrograph is shown on a reverse scale, it's a gray line along the top, it tells you that there's not much rain in the Snake River Basin. It's pretty much evenly distributed throughout the year from the 1st of October to the end of September. And stream flow at the seven gauges for which we have long-term record, six in the Snake, show that the stream flow is pretty much near zero for most of the year except during a snow melt period, and that the peak of the runoff is most pronounced in the headwater basin, Snake River 1, at the top of the basin, and is successively damp as you move downstream. This is just in terms of average daily flow, mean daily flow in millimeters over the whole period of record. The Willamette Basin is different. You know, it's still got, it, it's got mostly evergreen forest, and then if you add in the area which is mapped as shrub scrub, which is really probably regenerating clear cuts, you get about 60% forest cover, and then um, pasture, hay, fields, cultivated crops represent quite a large area, and developed land is up to 4% of the area. And the hydrograph and the hydrograph are quite different. We're on the west side of the Cascades. We get, the rain, we get winter rainfall peaking on the 30th of November, typically, and declining thereafter, declining very rapidly this year, which is sort of a cartoon exaggeration of the typical hydrograph. Remember, we had that we have really flooding in the first week of December at the end of fall term, and then practically zippo since then. And so we have a, a winter peaking hydrograph with most of the variability occurring in December through February, and then a 
varying amounts of sort of a, a little subtle bump here in the March to May time period, which is the pregnant tummy of the snowmelt runoff in the Willamette Basin. You know, if you compare the two basins in terms of the dams present in these two sub-basins, there are many more basins in uh, dams in the Snake River Basin. So these graphs show basin storage, normal storage on a log scale, and um, each dam or reservoir has a designator indicating the purposes for which it is managed. So there's several things to notice about this figure. First thing is the Willamette has fewer dams than the Snake, but if you divide the number of dams by the area of the basin, the, or you total up the storage of water provided by all those dams, it works out to be about the same in the two basins. Um, but they are managed for different purposes. Most of the dams, the, the big dams on the left side of this diagram for the Willamette are managed for flood control and multiple uses, including hydro and water supply. Whereas the Snake doesn't have very many multiple use dams, and most of them are hydroelectric or irrigation dams. Uh, so we did our analysis, and I'm going to tell you what we found first, and then I'm going to show it to you. What we found was that if you look at trends over time in stream flow at headwater basins, you see evidence of climate change effects, small ones, as expected, shifting earlier of the snow melt runoff over the period from 1950 to 2010. Changes are, are small. There is some inf uh, evidence that forest harvest and fire and other disturbances have left legacies in headwater basins as well. Below dams, the trends in stream flow seem very much to be, as you would expect, explained by what we know about flood uh, flow regulation, including flood control, irrigation, and flow management for various purposes. So here's an example of one of the analyses that we did for, I forget, 28 stream flow gauges with 60 years of record each. So here's an example. This is a headwater basin in the Snake River. This is the area of the basin. This is the median daily flow in blue in the first decade of the record and in red in the last decade of the record. And notice this happens to be a short record because it's only 30 years long. And, and what we did was for each day of the water year, we looked to see if there was a significant trend. And if there was, there's a little X up here indicating that the differences that you see between the red and the blue line amount to a statistically significant change. In this case, in this headwater basin record, over 30 years, there really weren't any significant changes. But if we look downstream in the same basin, you can see that there was significant change on many, many days of the water year. Um, and that the changes from the first decade, in terms of, the, again, median daily flow, from the first decade to this last decade indicate, in this case, which is a 200, almost 200,000 square kilometer basin at Weiser, or Weiser, I don't know how to pronounce that, indicate a reduction in the period in the in the runoff during the period of snow melt runoff, but also a reduction in flows in the other parts of the year. And further downstream, here we see little change, not no significant changes <coughs> in the magnitude and timing of the snow melt runoff peak, but a reduction in low flows. So remember, in the case of the Snake River, we had six gauges. So I will just briefly flash this up and say, this is what we actually published, which you don't really want to look at. But it shows the changes in temperature and the changes in precipitation and the timing and the magnitude of the changes in stream flow at gauges one to six, moving from the headwaters to downstream. And so if you squint at these for a while, and I still am, you know, yes, climate was warming, no surprise there, 
Above dams, we see little change in the Snake River, as I already showed you, but pretty much consistently below dams, we're seeing a reduction from the first decade, which is in gray, to the last decade, which is in black. We're seeing a reduction in the snowmelt runoff and also a reduction in low flows. And these graphs show how big the reductions are. Now we move to the Willamette. Here's the same, so here's the same deal. And we're looking at the headwaters now. Here is the hydrograph in the 1950s, which, have, which actually was a pretty wet decade. And here's the mean daily flow hydrograph in the, a recent decade. And then these X's indicate whether the slope of the regression line through that particular day for those 60 years was a significant slope, either positive or negative. So in this headwater basin, we see that these differences, the decline in snowpack runoff in March, were statistically significant. And we see also further down in this larger watershed, 100 times larger watershed, we also see significant declines on many days during the snowmelt runoff period, and also some significant declines in the dry season, which may be a forestry signal. So here's our headwater story, declining snowmelt runoff. Do we see that below dams? Well. We look below dams, and lo and behold, here's the pre, you know, early decade, the 1950s, and then here's the most recent decade, and we see a signal of flow shifting, the high flow shifting to earlier in the water year, and a reduction in flows throughout January, February, and March, both at Albany and Salem. Now, this is where it gets interesting because, you know, if you look at the whole deal for all seven of the Willamette gauges, you know, you, you see that above dams, we have a little bit of a signal of earlier high flows in the winter, which is sort of what's predicted about climate change. Snow will turn to rain, more water will run off as rain will run off, and we'll lose the snowpack peak, and we're seeing that, but we're also seeing similar trends downstream of dams, um, except that we're seeing increases in low flows downstream of dams. So if we try to look at a summary of these findings in space, <coughs> here's a picture of the Columbia River Basin. And each of these pairs of symbols is at a location of one of the stream flow gauges whose long-term record we examine. The circles, both red and green, refer to the presence of a signal that would be expected from climate change or would be interpreted as being caused by climate change. And the green circles re represent a gauge at which, over the 60-year period, there was a change in runoff consistent with a shift to earlier runoff during the snowmelt period. This is the most common prediction that is made for how stream flow is going to respond in our region. Uh, the second most common prediction for how stream flow may respond to climate change in our region is that late summer low flows will decline. Well, the snowmelt runoff will shift earlier and our system will dry out faster into the long dry season and we'll have exacerbated water shortages at the end of the water year. So places where we saw that signal are shown as red circles. We saw them here and we saw them over here in the lower part of the snake river basin down here. But is this really a climate change signal, or is it a regulatory signal? Something to do with flow regulation or land use? Because the squares show us places where we found a signal that also could be interpreted as being consistent 
with flow regulation and water management for flow. So the black and white squares, where the black is on the left and the white is on the right, show us places where the peak flows have declined, which is what you expect to happen in a stream gauge downstream of a dam being managed to control floods, right? And we found that everywhere. Everywhere the peak flows have declined, right? In, and these are, these are all, except for the headwater basins, these are all below the And in a few cases, we also found evidence of declining low flows in the late, uh, oh sorry, increased low flows in the late summer. And again, remember, this is the expected signal of flow regulation in this part of the world. You have dry summers, and so the water use for agriculture and for fish passage and for navigation all requires us to even out the hydrograph for the dam and reservoir management so that we augment late season's uh, flow, keep the large traffic running up the main stem of the Columbia River, provide water for farmers in late summer and so forth. And so we see evidence in a few places that the hydrograph has changed, has changed such that the low flows have been augmented, consistent with what we believe or expect water managers are doing. A, a really interesting one is this gauge right here, which is at the border of the Columbia River, uh, sorry, the border, U.S.-Canada border, where the Columbia River is flowing into the United States. Here, the record goes back to 1950, and this record was used in a paper that was published in 2008 in a science magazine in which the authors categorically declared that the long-term trends, and specifically the shift in the timing of spring snow melt runoff, had to be a climate change signal. But it isn't because the U.S. And the, and the Canadian government signed the Columbia River Treaty. When, John? Anybody know? So it's, oh, that's right, it's coming up next year. And so this signal is not consistent with climate change. It's consistent with flow regulation. But it has been interpreted as a climate change signal and published in what would one would expect. I don't know that. Thing. So the point is, regulatory effects on water flows may be mistaken for climate change if you're not watching out for other explanations. What is regulation doing to our hydrographs? Here's another way of looking at it. These graphs show basin area, and then the, the y-axis is the number of days in which there were significant changes in flows, either increases or decreases as a function of basin area. And what you can see is that as drainage area increases and you accumulate more dams upstream of the location where you're measuring change, the numbers of days that show significant trends over the period since 1950 increase. In other words, the signal of regulation is a cumulative one as you move downstream. So I think that one can say that headwater basins display ecological resilience in the sense that there has been some response of stream flow to climate change in those headwater basins, but not a lot. And I'll tell you what I think is going on in a minute. And clearly, the downstream gauges show, show trends indicating that those flows are being managed. Nobody's going to debate about that. But what's interesting about it is that the the effects that you would um, ascribe, the changes in flow that you would ascribe to climate change in the headwaters are not propagating downstream to where we in Fort Vallis and Albany or Portland could see them because they're being overprinted and reversed by the way the flows are being managed through the dams. So what does it really mean to, to say that water yield has ecological resilience? Well, I'm going to try to I'm going to blow your minds. This is the Budico curve. 
this is the thing that makes everybody go cross-eyed, me included. But here's, let me see if I can help you understand why this might be useful. The Rodigo curve shows energy as a driver of evaporation on the x-axis, right? And we all know that PET is a measure, potential evapotranspiration is a measure of energy, right? Because you calculate it. On the y-axis, we have a measure of actual water use, ecosystem water use, ADT. And everybody knows that ADT and PET don't necessarily add up to one another. But the degree to which they agree is a measure of the way of the extent to which the ecosystem actual water use is responding to energy. So that's relevant, right? Because when we think that a, a basin is going to respond to climate change, what we're really saying is that energy is going to increase. Energy coming into the system is going to increase. And we're interested in what happens to the to a particular point at a particular place that represents the relationship between the energy to drive evaporation and how much water is actually evaporated. So we know from long-term forestry experiments that you can have a point, a watershed, which over the long term indicates that the, the ecosystem is transpiring, evapotranspiring about as much water as you would sort of expect it to do given the energy inputs, right? You perturb that system and you cut down the trees and what happens? What happens to ADT? Actual evapotranspiration when you cut it goes down, right? So that's what hap that's what happens. If you cut a watershed, AET goes down and this point will float down here because this is AET. And then as the forest regenerates, the point will float back up toward the deeper. <coughs> so this may be a measure of ecological resilience the capacity of a system to bounce back onto the Budigo curve to do the amount of evapotranspiring that you would expect it to do given the energy inputs to the system. So now what happens if we have a point which is a different watershed, or the same one, and what we do is we're not perturbing it by cutting the vegetation, but we're perturbing it by climate change. So we're increasing the energy driver of evaporation. What would represent what would be a resilient behavior of that point if you if you push it to the right? What would it do? If it's resilient, what will that point do? Yeah, that's right. It'll try to hug the curve, right? It, it will go to the right and then will come up. So the Budico curve may be a useful way for us to plot long-term records of individual points and ask, oh, as climate changes and energy inputs change over time, do the curves move around? Do they slide, do the points slide along the Budico curve or do they go off in other directions? Well, so much for theory. Here's reality. Uh, you know, this is 10 years of record from 35 sites where we actually plotted the points at, in Budico space relative to the theoretical Budico curve shown by the dashed line. And interestingly, if you fit a line by eye, I did this last night, this is not a regression. But if you fit a line by eye through the location of these points, you get an interesting insight, which I don't understand. I don't understand what it means. It could just be an accident, but it could be reality. So the Budico curve says, that points will fall on this line, that the relationship between energy as a driver of evaporation and actual ecosystem water use should be represented by this point, by this curve. And actually, the reviewer on a recent proposal said, well, one of the reasons we're going to not fund your proposal is because you have points above the Budico curve, and that's impossible. Well, it's not impossible. It happens. There may be multiple reasons for it. One possible reason is that it may be that there is something about the way natural ecosystems function. And these are all headwater, relatively undisturbed ecosystems. They're long-term ecological research sites. It may be that headwater ecosystems are actually capable 
of using more, of, of evapotranspiring more water than you would expect given the energy limitations. And I don't know, I, I can't offer any particular explanation for why that might be true, but it may, but it's an interesting one to consider. And then when you get over here into what are supposed to be energy uh, moisture limited systems, the dry places of uh, Sevilla, uh, Central Arizona, Phoenix, Santa Barbara, Bonanza Creek, which is Alaska, Hounds of Prairie, the ecosystems seem to actually be using less water than you would expect by the So this is sort of interesting. But what does it help? How does it help us think about climate change? Well, one way of looking at this is you can take the interannual variations in what a point is doing and plot them as these spider diagrams where all of the rays of a particular co color indicate where this particular point would plot if you did use only one year of data. And, and so remember, our hypothesis is that a point, an ecosystem that is resilient is going to hug the Budico curve, right? So the ellipse represented by the spider diagram ought to be long and flat in this part of the Budico curve and ought to be tall and thin in this part of the Budico curve. And to some extent, we observe that, although we haven't really quantified it. But it's a way to help think about what ecological resilience means. In terms of engineering resilience, you know, it gets us thinking about how dams might, how dams are being managed. Are they being managed in a coordinated fashion? Are they being managed for multiple objectives? Are they being managed for climate change? And this work raises the question of whether, if we have a system of multiple dams, which are managed for multiple purposes, not including climate change, do we nevertheless have a system that is characterized by engineering resilience that in some sense protects us from climate change? Or does it actually make us, is it a brittle form of resilience such that we go along believing that there are no climate change effects because we can't perceive them because we're living downstream of dams and then some threshold happens and then we're really in trouble. So my conclusions are going to be unsatisfying with the question. <laughs> you know, this is what I'm wondering about. Will climate change, if climate change, the signal of climate change is not now apparent below dams in the Columbia River, it seems to be. But, we only have 50 or 60 years of record. Does, will something happen differently in the next 50 years? Possibly. Such that the climate change signal will propagate downstream and will become really evident. Is that what's happening in the Snake River Basin in some parts of it where flows are declining throughout the year? What does it mean if our society attributes signals that are actually due flow regulation to climate change? What does that do for the kind of policy decisions that we make? Is it a problem? Maybe it's not. Maybe it's a good thing. And what if we are trying to adapt to climate change? We would like to adapt to climate change, but we don't sense it. Ah, you know, it's a colder winter than usual. There's no climate change. So with those questions, I will stop with my acknowledgement of co-authors, including Hatcher, a master's student at Irina Creed in Ontario, and I would like to acknowledge the NSF LTER network, the Andrews Forest LTER Forest Service, and the U.S. Geological Survey that provided the records for this analysis, and I'll stop for questions.
so the trends shown by this analysis seem to me to be capturing the effects of a cumulative number of dams at which flow is being regulated. Thank you very much for your is related to the lens paper uh, of the change in temperature that does not, those changes do not match the change in, in the air temperature. Right. So I wonder if there's anything you can say about those trends in terms of, you know, the fed water streams being changing or not due to the change. Well, I have a little hypothesis, which I'll bring on Jim, which is that about, how was that, that Sharon? worked with us on, um, you know, long-term <coughs> studies of riparian vegetation cover along the Willamette. And basically, the, the effects of flow regulation and canalization have meant that there's less forest disturbance in riparian zones along the Willamette River and more old forest and closed canopy forest in now than there was 30, 40, 50 years ago. So one possibility is that effects of flow regulation and other changes forestry practices have increased the amount of shading over time that could be one possible explanation for the bonds result. But uh, it would be interesting to check that out. There's a question over here. Yeah. Um, so I think you mentioned that resilient systems would help the Bidico curve. Well, it's a, it's a conjecture. Right. So just one example that kind of came to mind with me was Say you're increasing the energy of the system, so the dot would initially move to the right. Yeah. That would mean that the evapotranspiration was staying constant. Right. right? Not responding and, initially. Right. And aren't you saying that a resilient system would maintain the same yields, so the evapotranspiration would be constant? Well, that's really so. So what what do we mean by constancy and persistence? You know, and this is where the definitions of resilience. Um, kind of squishy or selective, depending on your point of view. But one, one way of thinking about a constant system is a system that adapts in the face of change. So if you imagine the point being pushed to the right, initially evapotranspiration might stay the same because the ecosystem has the same trees or vegetation in it. But then over time, there may be death by stress and you know changes that allow the, the point to reoccupy re the curve. And so then this raises the question on what time scales might we expect to see these kinds of forms of adaptation at the watershed level. And Irina is currently working on a paper where she's trying to quantify whether you can see that happening over consecutive 10 year periods. And, it, and you know, then we get to this point where, well, we already have 60 year records, but they're not long. <laughs> you know, um, so, but that's the idea. Yeah. yeah. Have you guys decided to look at trends of daily flow? I was wondering if there was like, much debate about like, what, or how you decide on daily and what, what is the most appropriate measure for trends of stream flow? Uh, um, well, um, for Pepiti, um, you know, there are lots of metrics. Peak flows, people get all excited about peak flows. And as Chad and Mark, I, Gordon and I published a paper that, I guess the secret to getting excited often is to publish something that makes people really mad. <laughs> so peak flows get everybody all excited, and that's what the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is supposed to manage the dams for flood control because it, it hurts people. It damages property. But then low flows are really important too. And so a reason for focusing on this daily analysis is because Stan Gregory said to me, well, what about when I was doing those, when Gordon and I were doing those peak flow analysis 20 years ago, well, what about low flows that, you know, fish really depend on low flows. The Willamette Basin analysis is a big consequence of these alternative future scenarios in the Willamette Basin is the degree to which the stream network is, um, becomes contracted because of changes in flow, which change habitat. So a choice of using daily flows allows you to capture both 
and look at them at different times of year and think about the timing. So, and that's, you know, seems relevant to the climate change discussion, which is a lot about shifts in timing of stuff. And daily data are available digitally, so it's handy. It's much harder to get power or to extract peak floors. So Julie, if it's the hypothesis of a change in the peak floor, it's just changing the hydro uh, that is having space or uh, unfazed the peak floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. And uh, the peak floor is actually not a peak floor. It's 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 a peak floor. The peak of the stream flow shifting backwards over time, so that flows increase in the early part of the and increase in the latter part of the peak, indicating the shift. But you can also do that by land use change. You know, there was a fire that burned in the Antigua, which was one of our reference basins. And there, if climate change were operating, we'd and this is time October to September, and here's the snowmelt peak. If climate change were operating, we'd expect the snowmelt peak to go this way earlier. But we also know from forestry studies that if you cut the forest canopy in a snowy area, you increase snowpack accumulation and delay melt. So burning would affect, would be expected to cause the snowmelt runoff peak to go this way later. And in fact, in the Antia, we see no effect over time because the fire effects counteracted the climate change effects and there was no change in the time. So there's lots more room for theses and dissertations on this subject <laughs> for anybody who's interested. Well, let's continue the discussion in 3000 and nine. I think it's 3000. And let's thank you for working.